Welcome and thank you for stopping by Sheila's Audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain for United States copyright law. These stories were first published around April 1910. They are about Lord Lister called John C. Raffles the most brilliant among all thieves. He is the terror of usurers and money lenders, robs them of their possessions by his wiles, protecting beleaguered innocents and supporting the needy. Man of honor in all respects. He persuaded that many abuses, protected by law, continue to proliferate with impunity. Every effort is made to apprehend Lord Lister, called John C. Raffles, the most brilliant of thieves. Reward, £1,000 sterling. Lord Lister in the Catacombs of Paris by Gert Matchell and Theo Blakenzy. Chapter 1 The Flight A thick fog, enveloping towns and villages like an impenetrable veil, hung over the streets of London. He penetrated the houses, and the great canopy of Victoria Station seemed to want to suck up these heavy clouds, so that even the bright glow of the electric arc lamps was unable to illuminate the platform. It was eight o'clock in the morning. The train, which runs to Dover in connection with the boats which sail to France, was ready for departure. The front part of the train vanished into the semi-darkness of the fog, which at this moment seemed to have grown heavier still, and which enveloped like a protective veil two men who walked swiftly across the platform. The older of the two, a slender elegant personality with a full blonde beard, threw his city bag into an open first-class compartment. Then he turned to his companion, to whom he spoke in a soft but firm tone. Charlie, I'm warning you. Do not chain your young life to the adventurous existence that awaits me. The other seemed to scarcely hear these words, and with even more conviction the speaker continued. Stay here, Charlie, I don't blame you. He wanted to say more, but the younger, in whose beardless pale face twinkled two dark eyes interrupted him. What does this mean? I'm going with that and out with that. He put his travel bag on the sofa next to his traveling companions. Then both sat down without saying a word. It was two minutes before the time of departure and already the conductors were closing the compartment doors, when suddenly several paper boys stood waiting for them. The train appeared, and, holding up the extra issues of the morning papers, they shouted aloud. Raffles has been discovered. One thousand pounds reward. Raffles is the same as Lord Edward Lister. An English nobleman as a criminal. Raffles has escaped. The two travellers who had just boarded heard these exclamations too, but only Charlie seemed concerned about this, his older friend only listened to the news of the newspaper boys with a mocking laugh. He got up and opened the window of the compartment door. Drawing two coins from his pocket, he called one of the boys who had just emerged from the mist before him, and bought a paper. Then the signal to leave sounded and the train started moving. And while still the cry, Raffles has been discovered thousand pounds reward. Echoed across the platform, Lord Edward Lister, alias Raffles, the same for whose arrest the London police had offered such a large sum, accompanied by his friend and secretary Charlie Brand, left the English capital to save himself beyond the canal. The Senegambia, a small, unsightly steamer, which seemed unable to face the dangers of the canal, left the roadstead at Dover. The thick fog seemed to lift. The chalk cliffs of the English coast were still visible when the naked eye could already discern the harbour works of Calais. Lord Lister had boarded alone, and Charlie Brand had accepted the crossing on the ship, as if he did not know the other at all. One had to be prepared for anything, and although Raffles thought little of the detective skills of the English police pursuing him, he did not fail to cover his trail as much as possible. He could be sure that the United Kingdom harbour authorities had been notified by telegraph of a very complete description of the fugitive and his friend. In this regard, however, Lord Lister had taken his measures. A false beard, very artfully constructed and attached, and an injection of paraffin which allowed his nose to be reshaped, had made him so different from the description that his own mother would not have recognized him. He had, moreover, an American passport which legitimized him as a citizen of the United States, Harrison, and it was easy for Raffles to pronounce the words as the Yankees would. 
When the train arrived at Dover, Raffles and Charlie had left the compartment like two strangers who happened to have traveled some distance together. At the exit from the platform, Lord Lister had noticed the police officers, who were looking at all the passengers with suspicion. In a drawn-out American-English tone he had called a porter and ordered him to bring his luggage aboard. He conversed for some time in Yankee dialect with the man who, carrying his traveling bag, walked beside him, and passed unimpeded by the spying officers. Charlie had passed them just as easily, for his description had not been given and so no one paid any attention to him. The boat split the waves of the channel at reasonable speed. Lord Lister was on the quarterdeck, and Charlie approached him, sauntering about indifferently. Close to his friend he stopped to look with great interest into the water. The quarterdeck was completely deserted, and no one witnessed the conversation the two friends had together without looking at each other. The Lord spoke. I have seriously thought about it, we must part for the time being. Is that urgent? came from Charlie's lips. Yes, replied Lord Lister. The papers state that Raffles fled with his secretary, but no description of you has been given. I must be careful, and will hide in Paris until my false beard is replaced by a real one. With the help of paraffin injections I will keep my nose in this shape and with my strong beard growth I can certainly reappear in three weeks without fear. And what shall I do at that time? asked Charlie. I'm putting the wallet here in the bank with the fifty thousand pounds that I snatched from the insurance company. When I leave, you take them in, you take a different compartment from me in Calais and travel to Paris. There you take up residence in the Hotel Regina under the name M.C. Allen and you impersonate a rich Scotsman who has come to Paris for pleasure for a few weeks. You live by it, show yourself very generous, and don't care about me anymore. And what happens to you? Charlie Brand inquired in an anxious tone. I still have two thousand pounds on me, which is more than enough to do everything in my power to cover all possible traces in those three weeks. And without waiting any further reply, Lord Lister laid the black wallet containing the banknotes on one of the wooden chairs near him and walked up to the cabin staircase which led to the small smoking parlor. Charlie approached the folding chair, picked up the wallet and put it in his breast pocket. As if musing he sat for a few minutes, staring at the increasingly distant English coast. He then got up and made his way to the center deck, where several passengers had made themselves comfortable in wide reclining seats. On one of these chairs a young girl rested, her slender figure was swathed in a plaid which sheltered her from the fresh sea breeze. Her face, which was very interesting in spite of the light blonde hair, was shadowed by a broad English travel cap, held in a long veil tied under the chin. Charlie could not help resting his eyes on the attractive creature for a while. This whole apparition emanated a great charm. Two small boots emerged from the plaid which covered the dress, which closely encircled a pair of most graceful feet. A sudden wind pressure occasionally showed the fine ankles, and when the hand emerged from under the plaid, the graceful, slender fingers were discovered beneath the thin silk glove. The lady, who had hitherto been lying quietly in her chair, seemed to feel that she was drawing attention. She looked up, and a long, defiant look from her dark eyes, which stood out infrequently against the blonde hair, fell upon Charlie. The latter now turned away, as though he feared, to attract attention here by embarking on gallant adventures. Dash. The Senegambia entered the port of Calais and the train to Paris was waiting a short distance from the landing stage. Raffles was already standing in the side aisle of the train in front of a first-class compartment, and he couldn't help but smile when he saw his friend Charlie Brand take his place in the adjoining compartment, along with the piquant beauty who had already noticed him on board. The train started moving. Lord Lister retired to the compartment. If M.C. Allen might have intended to play his part as a wealthy Scot in Paris with the help of a gallant lady, he wouldn't mind. He gladly granted the poor boy whose affection struck him, that pleasure. At Amiens, the first station of importance, Lord Lister bought the Parisian morning paper, which was sold to the station, and to his great satisfaction saw that the Paris press was no less engaged in conjectures about the mysterious existence of Raffles, Lord Lister. He felt even safer when he noticed that the description of the French papers matched his disguised appearance as little as that of the English. The train steamed into the giant station of Street Lazare in Paris, where the light of the electric lamps shone. Lord Lister had left the platform and was just about to get into a carriage when he looked around for his friend in the crowd. He saw him and again a smile flew across his face. 
Charlie Brown stood a short distance from him, in front of an open carriage, and helped the blonde lady aboard. Then he called to the coachman an address which the Lord could not understand because of the noise about him, and sat down with the lady, and the carriage rolled away. Laughing, Raffles climbed into his hired carriage and drove to the hotel he had given the coachman. Chapter 2. Stolen Good Doesn't Produce. Raffles had been in Paris for four days. For four days already he reveled in the ever-growing sense of security which overcame him as he read the papers about his own affairs. He had rented a room in a second-rate hotel in Montparnasse. Lord Lister stood before the narrow entrance to his hotel and thought about how he would spend the evening. He was bored, and he was sorry to miss Charlie's company for so long. It was half-past four and the first evening papers must have already appeared. Raffles walked to the nearest newspaper stand and, walking slowly, unfolded the sheet he had bought there, his gaze racing along the columns. Suddenly he stopped. His eye remained on the bold inscription of a small town notice, the contents of which greatly interested him. There it read in bold letters. Attempted suicide in Hotel Regina. A wealthy Scotsman is looted in a gallant adventure and, in desperation, tries to take his own life. Raffles struggled to control himself. No doubt about it, this rich Scotsman mentioned here had to be Charlie Brand. With feverish haste he flew through the article, which confirmed his suspicion. The Scot's name was M.C. Allen, he had tried to put a bullet in the head and was taken to Street Louis Hospital with serious injuries. Raffles did not hesitate for a moment. He jumped into a carriage and twenty minutes later he was at the entrance of the hospital. Without much effort he managed to be admitted to Charlie's bedside. The unfortunate was fully conscious. The bullet, which had entered the back of the head, had already been removed by the doctors and the danger of life had passed. When Raffles entered Charlie Brand brought tears to his eyes. The young doctor who had brought Raffles in humbly withdrew, and scarcely were the two friends alone when Charlie, sobbing, told what had happened to him. He had joined the woman who had noticed him on board the Senna Gambia. After repeatedly refusing at first, she had agreed on the second day to go to the theatre with him. Charlie had planned less on seeking gallant adventures than on the Lord Lister's gift to him to play the role of the overconfident rich man well. After the end of the performance, the lady's car had been waiting for him. Charlie had got in and the blonde lady had presented him with a smile from a stuffed bonbonniere. With her shapely white hand she had pushed one of the bonbons into his mouth. Furthermore, Charlie did not know what had happened to him. He must have fallen asleep in the carriage, and at five o'clock in the morning a police officer found him on the corner of Rue Rivoli, near his hotel. He lay there on the cobblestones, leaning against a wall. The wallet, with £49,000 in it, had disappeared, other valuables and a few hundred franc bills, which he carried in his waistcoat pocket, had been left in his possession. After he had been taken to the hotel, he had only come to the full realization of what had happened to him. The dreadful fact was clear before his eyes, he had lost the treasure entrusted to him. Desperation seized him, he wanted to put a bullet in his head, but the shot failed and only wounded him without killing him. Raffles had listened to Charlie's story without interrupting. Thank God, he exclaimed, that your hand trembled, and that you were unable to carry out your plan. How can one be so stupid, my boy, to take one's own life for a little money? Charlie looked at him with moist eyes. So you forgive me, Edward? Oh come, there is nothing to forgive, replied Raffles. I feel a tremendous desire to play the part of Sherlock Holmes in this special case, in order to track down that noble lady and her accomplices, for she must have them, and, if possible, give them back some of the looted. To take. You don't know which way the car took? No, I have no inkling of it, for apparently I fell asleep immediately after using the bonbon, said Charlie. Well, I've seen the fair lady aboard, and would recognize her in any disguise. Should chance lead me in her way, you can be sure that I will track down the hotbed of iniquity. What do you want to do? asked Charlie anxiously. Nothing for now, replied Lord Lister. I'll just make sure I'm prepared for such an accident and don't fall victim to her sedatives. In addition, I would not like the police to interfere with me. For the time being I would rather have nothing to do with those gentlemen. Charlie smiled. Have you been questioned yet? Raffles asked suddenly. No, not yet, said the patient, but that will be tonight. 
The commissioner's visit has already been announced to me. Raffles seemed to think seriously for a moment. Tell him what you will, he said at last, but by no means the truth, take him as far off the track as possible, for I want to unravel this matter undisturbed and at my leisure. Understood? Charlie nodded. A sigh of relief escaped the young man, now that his friend had not reproached him at all. I am going now and come to see you again tomorrow, said Raffles, rising. Then he shook hands with Charlie in a few kind words and departed. The Acacia Alley and the Bois de Boulogne is the meeting point of the elegant idlers of both sexes, which are more numerous in Paris than anywhere in the world. Ladies of the good class only go here in the company of gentlemen, while the representatives of the demimonde and of the stage world stroll here alone or accompanied by their luxury dogs. The jumble of people was very busy today in the Acacia Alley. Horsemen and walkers passed each other in motley rows, elegant vehicles rattled to and fro on the autumn leafed roadway. On one of the hired chairs, which were laid out on either side of the road, sat a solitary spectator. The Yankee-style beard, the heavy eyebrows, and the large, too broad-pointed nose clearly betrayed the American, while the solid yet elegant dress completed the type. The man gave the impression of being very blustered and rich, and whoever saw him there, watching the ladies walking by with his clear, grey-blue eyes, must have thought that he had come here to seek pleasant, feminine company. There, at the end of the avenue, an elegant crew approached. The lady driving the horses, a typical blonde whose remarkably simple toilet betrayed her fine taste, seemed to be unknown in this area, for, unlike the other women, no one greeted her. Yet she seemed to attract the general attention, and when the American noticed the fair carriage driver from his seat, he rose to get a better look at her. The blonde, when she had reached the center of the alley, leapt out of the carriage with a graceful movement. She threw the reins to the groom, who was sitting in the back seat, and made her way to the walkway. The lone spectator kept his eyes fixed on her. With keen attention he followed all her movements and saw her looking inquisitively at the gentleman who passed her with a smile. None of them seemed to please her, however, and so she approached the American, who looked into her eyes with a long look and an almost imperceptible smile as he politely took off his hat for her. A nod and an encouraging look from the dark eyes was his reward. He approached her, and in impeccable French, with a slight American accent, said. Madame. I am grateful to you for the manner in which you answer my rude greeting. Ah, you are an American, replied the lady, smiling, and before he could answer her, she continued. If you like, we'll have a party together in Café de Madrid. I will, of course, accede to your wishes, replied the gallant American. The lady turned, the crew was sent by the groom to the edge of the footpath, she sat down and grabbed the reins. With an eloquent wave of her hand she invited the American to take the place at her side. Raffles, for it was he, rode with the adventurer, whom he had at once recognized as the fairest of the Senegambia, to the Café de Madrid. The meal was over. The waiters, silently serving the guests of the expensive Café de Madrid, placed the mocha cups on the table where Raffles and his elegant lady had dined. Maintenance went very smoothly, but Raffles had every reason to be surprised. Every attempt he used to give the conversation a more or less spicy touch, was shipwrecked. Raffles was puzzled. This woman, who had allowed herself to be addressed by him as a shrewd demi-mundane, now behaved like a lady of the best circles. And yet he was sure to face the same person who had made Charlie her victim. Her invitation, however, to go to the opera with her in the evening, dispelled his doubts again. He promised her, and they both rose to leave. She declined his offer to take her home, as well as his offer to collect her in the evening. She bade him wait for her by eight o'clock at the steps of the Grand Opera. Then she took place in a graceful crew waiting outside, took the reins from the groom's hands, and after a gracious nod from the lady the carriage withdrew and was soon out of sight of the astonished Traffles. Chapter 3 In the Lion's Cave The performance at the Groot Opera was over. In the bright light of the electric lamps an immense crowd moved along the boulevard, so that the great stream of opera-goers leaving the building dissolved themselves imperceptibly. Lord Lister strode through the middle vestibule on the side of his last conquest. A baggy black evening gown hung over his shoulders, covering only a little of the neat evening dress, which showed off his tall stature very advantageously. His mate, whose splendid frock was visible beneath the loosely wrapped white theatre cloak, now turned to her new friend. I have ordered my motor car, 
and if you like it, we will have supper in my house, I've had everything ready. Raffles accepted the invitation with a friendly smile. He felt that the decisive moment had come and that such a fate had befallen him as had befallen his friend Charlie, who had left the hospital already fourteen days ago, fully recovered. Lord Lister had not informed his friend that he was on the trail of the brigand. Here's my car, said the lady, pointing to one of the many ready rail cars. Home. She cried to the little thin driver, gallantly, Lord Lister opened the compartment door and helped her climb in. With a grip in his coat pocket he convinced himself that his pistol was there at his disposal, then he sat down next to the lady and the car turned onto the road to the Champs-Élysées. Raffles took a gold cigarette case from his waistcoat pocket and said to the fair blonde. Surely you will permit me to smoke a cigarette? Oh, I was just about to offer you my bonbons, she replied, and a small bonbonniere was brought out. Lord Lister's heart pounded, for now the critical moment had come. Let's trade, madam. I'll take your bonbon if you take a few puffs on my cigarette with your little mouth. If you like, she said with a laugh and two rows of pearls glittered between her lips. He put a cigarette between her lips and gave her fire. As she sucked in the long-drawn tobacco smoke, her ringed white fingers took a bonbon from the ornate box and held it to her cavalier's mouth. Raffles knew the effect of this candy store. Carefully he held the bonbon between his teeth, and as he bent to kiss his lady's hand, he dropped the dangerous anaesthetic into his right hand. With an empty mouth he continued the chewing motion for a few moments more. He saw with great satisfaction that the lady paid tribute to his cigarette. Thereupon he leaned back into the cushions and apparently closed his eyes, but fixed his gaze between the barely open eyelids unabated on his companion. He saw clearly how she looked at him with a devilish smile. She waited a moment more, then got up, turned off the electric light that burned in the car, and signaled the driver by knocking repeatedly on one of the windows. The carriage, meanwhile, had reached the place de la Concorde and was now turning toward the Champs-Élysées. The cigarette, which contained a potent sedative, had to start working soon to make Raffles' plan a success, for he had no idea how long the journey might last. Now he suddenly noticed that the lady leaned back and lay motionless in that position. To be sure, he stepped on her foot, seemingly in a deep sleep, but she didn't move. Now he rose and bent over her, she was fast asleep and Raffles knew she would not wake for the first ten hours. He took off his baggy evening gown with determination, he put the revolver in one of his trouser pockets for safekeeping. With this he took the light theatrical cloak from her shoulders and threw his coat about her, wrapping her in such a way that her dress was completely covered. He threw her cloak loosely on, so that he could throw it off at any moment without difficulty. Now he looked out the window. The car had just turned into one of the broad avenues of the Bois de Boulogne, and Raffles understood from the reduced speed that they were approaching the object of the journey. He looked carefully outside and, despite the insufficient lighting, could distinguish the house numbers. The car stopped, a single glance told Raffles that the house in front of the garden gate they were standing was number 117. The driver gave a signal with his horn, the gate seemed to open automatically, and the car drove slowly in until just before the high spacious gate of the building. Raffles saw the figure of an old man emerge from the open door, and he could clearly hear the driver whisper to the old man. He's sedated, Tatiana gave me the signal. The car had now entered through the gate, the wide doors had closed again, and Raffles could see by the light of the two car lanterns the driver leaping from the box and approaching the door with the old man. The decisive moment had come. Raffles' right hand clutched his revolver and as he opened the door from within with the left, he whispered in a low voice. P.S.S., light it up. At these words he lifted the coat-clad female figure into the arms of the two men. Because the light in the car was no longer on, it was impossible for both of them to detect anything of the deception. They were immediately ready to take their prey in, and had just reached the circle of light of the two carriage lamps with their alleged victim, when a thunderous voice cried out to them. Stop. They looked around in horror. Paralyzed with terror, they dropped their burden. In front of them, leaning against the car, stood a man dressed in a skirt, who held out his revolver with a menacing gesture. A single glance at the figure lying at their feet told them what had happened. Before a single word had passed their lips, Raffles' commands sounded commandingly. Take that woman up and carry her into the house, I'll follow you and shoot you both at the least opposition.
This weapon is enough to kill seven villains with it. The old man tried to answer something in a stammering tone, but already it sounded. Don't say a word or I'll shoot. Come on, do as I command you. Trembling with terror, the men surveyed the motionless body and, followed by Raffles, who held the pistol in one hand and his electric flashlight in the other, the group began to move in silence. They went up a flight of stairs that led to a glass door. This brought them into a vestibule, which was dimly lit by a single electric light. On this vestibule, which was covered with thick carpets and to which comfortable English club shares gave a certain cosy coziness, opened three doors, which apparently gave access to the main rooms of the villa. The two porters looked back at Raffles, as if awaiting further orders. Raffles ordered them to lay down Tatiana. Keeping his weapon pointed at them, he now began in a low, but no less commanding voice. Three weeks ago you robbed the Scotsman Macallan of everything and took from him £49,000, in English banknotes of £1,000. You must give me that money back. We have it no more, stammered the old man, trembling. You are lying, replied Raffles calmly, and when the old man could not answer, he went on. You have the choice, either you give the money back and I will leave you alone and worry about you no more, or you refuse, and I will immediately call the police after I have informed you first by means of this weapon, made it impossible to flee. Don't you yourself belong to the police? The old man now, very surprised, dared to ask. No, replied Raffles, smiling at the thought that he had been mistaken for a detective. The old man seemed to think for a moment, but Raffles did not give him much time. Now, quick, I'm waiting for an answer, he snapped. Hesitantly the old one began. I have told you the truth. We have only a part of the money left, if you want to follow us, you can convince yourself. All right, replied Raffles. You're making progress, but if you think you're kidding me, count on your last moment coming. The old man opened one of the doors that opened onto the vestibule and entered, followed by the driver. Makes light, ordered Raffles, and in the same instant a great crown burned from the ceiling in the center of the room. Raffles entered and surveyed the room with a single glance. The old man went to a writing table and wanted to open one of the drawers. Stop! cried Raffles. What's in there? The rest of the money, replied the old man. No weapons? No, it sounded back. Dude, I don't believe you, said Raffles. He ordered the driver to stand in the farthest corner of the room with his arms raised. The man obeyed. Now Raffles approached the old man and, pressing the mouth of the pistol against one of the temples, bade him open the writing table. If there's anything in the writing desk that belies your words, I'll shoot. The writing table contains nothing but books and the rest of the money, replied the threatened man, trembling with fear. Then open them. Raffles saw that the old man had spoken the truth. Before his eyes lay his own wallet, the same one he had given to Charlie Brand aboard the Senegambia. Raffles picked them up and opened them without losing sight of the two men. There were still nineteen banknotes in one thousand pounds. Where's the rest of the money? asked Raffles, but speak the truth. The old man did not hesitate for a moment. I used it to buy this house that we used to rent. By what name did you become its owner? My name is Gregor Komart's chef. Are you Russian? Of Russian descent, but Turkish subject. And Tatiana? Is my daughter, and he? Raffles pointed his revolver at the driver. That's my cousin Andre. Have you long been living your villainous existence? inquired Raffles. No, sir, replied Comart's chef, and believe me, the object of our robberies is less villainous than the deed. The money we obtain will serve to free our unfortunate brothers in Turkey. Lord Lister was too suspicious of character to believe such a sentimental tale without a fight. On the other hand, after all he had seen here, appearances were before the old man. He took the wallet with the rest of the money and put it all with him. Then he spoke to the pair in a less menacing tone. Your desire to pocket rich idlers to spend their money on more useful purposes is not wholly unsympathetic to me, and it may well be possible that we reached an agreement. If you are frank with me, you have nothing to fear from me, even if the missing money should not show up again. I will come to you tomorrow afternoon with my friend M. C. Allen the very same whom you looted three weeks ago, and if you can prove to me that your stories are based on truth, I will be of service to you in more ways than one. 
I don't trust you yet. So go ahead of me both and bring me out again. When I am gone, you must put Tatiana to bed. In the course of the morning she will wake up from her stupor of her own accord. Look, now show me the way. Both men walked in front of him, and after a few minutes Raffles had left the house in the avenue of the Bois de Boulogne. He walked the dark streets in the events of that day, from the meeting in the Bois de Boulogne to the dramatic conclusion, passed through his mind once more. The young girl's enigmatic behavior was now understandable to him. The old man's story suffices to explain Tatiana's wonderful attitude. But would Komart's chef's words be true? It was easy for Raffles to believe it. But he did not like to let his feeling work alone on matters that could only be clarified by a logical thinking mind. Yet again and again the lovely apparition of Tatiana loomed before him, beside the image of artless sorrow which awakened the thought of old Komart's chef in him, and when Raffles went to bed at three o'clock in the morning he hoped with all his heart that the result of his inquiry into the inhabitants of the villa would not contradict their own statements. Chapter 4 In the Catacombs Tatiana Komart's chair awoke from her sedation. The sun was high in the sky and its rays shone on the bed on which the young girl had been laid with great care by her father. Now she raised her eyes and gradually her consciousness returned. She lifted her head and looked around the room. Her father sat in a corner of the room. Daddy, what happened? It sounded anxiously from her lips now. The old man rose, trembling and pale as he approached his daughter's bed. My dear child, we have been betrayed, everything has been discovered. Startled, Tatiana jumped up. Daddy, let us flee, we will find elsewhere the means to help and support our oppressed people in their struggle against the tyrannical yoke. The old man shook his head. In short words he told her the events of the last night. In the meantime Andre entered the room. He stood in silence at the door, and his gaze hung with slavish admiration on the features of the fair Tatiana. Komart's chef had told his story and Tatiana, who had settled into the cushions, asked. Do you think that gentleman will really come back? Yes, replied her father. He said he wanted his friend M.C. Allen, the Scot, would bring. The poor man who fell into our hands three weeks ago, exclaimed the young girl as a beam of joy brightened her countenance. An expression of hatred and contempt appeared in Andre's eyes, and he muttered a few unintelligible words angrily. Komart's chef looked at him questioningly, and Andre said in a disgruntled tone. Tatiana's great interest in that handsome Scotsman at once seemed to me a bad omen, and so it turned out. It even now seems as if she is looking forward to seeing him again. If she carries such thoughts in her mind, the cause of our people will suffer. Tatiana cast a look of contempt at the young man, and said without hesitation. You wouldn't mind, of course, if I sacrificed the interests of our people to your person, but I assure you this will never happen. There is no time now for quarreling, let us rather discuss what to do, interrupted Komart's chef. There is not much to discuss, muttered Andre. If those two really do venture here, it would be best to shut them up forever. Tatiana stared at him with a look of horror. Komart's chef arose, his countenance grave, and an expression of calm dignity upon his countenance, as he spoke to his nephew. We have robbed and used the property of others for our purpose, but I know that I can answer for all my deeds before my supreme judge. Never, however, shall these hands, which stretched out to the money of others to present it to our oppressed brethren, be stained with the blood of innocent men. Andre was about to answer, when at the same instant the bell rang. Both men left the room. The old housekeeper, who came every day to do her business in the villa, opened the door and let Raffles and Charlie in. When the old woman had moved away, Raffles asked. Has your daughter awakened? Yes, an hour ago, replied Komart's chef. And may we see her? Raffles inquired further. She is still in bed, said Komart's chef, but if the gentleman will enter with us, and he opened the door of Tatiana's bedroom. The young girl's eyes filled with tears as she saw the two gentlemen who had been destined to be her victims. Sobbing violently, she fell back into the pillows. Raffles was astonished to see her emotion, so unaffected that he could no longer doubt the truth of Komart's Jeff's story. Charlie Brand was deeply affected. A feeling of infinite pity overcame him, and he timidly approached the young girl. I pray you, be calm and dry your tears. My friend has communicated to me the explanation which your father gave him, 
and I believe unreservedly in its truth. A look of deep gratitude struck Charlie. She extended her narrow white hand, which he held for a while in his, and with trembling lips she begged. Forgive me for what I did to you. Charlie struggled to hold back his tears. I have long forgiven you, and my friend and I have come here, not to avenge us, but to help you. Raffles had watched the two with a smile. Now he came a step nearer and said. So, gentlemen, we must not get sentimental now, but deliberate practically and calmly as to what to do. He turned to Comart's chef. My name is Donald Harrison and I am American. I believe that you have spoken the truth tonight, and therefore not only do I not want to give an account of what you have done, but I am even prepared to help you further in the interest of your intended purpose. However, as a first condition, I demand that your daughter be no longer used for such disgraceful things as are unworthy of her. With a furious look and returned to the American. For what reason are you concerned about the fate of this lady? Raffles looked at the young man in surprise. Not for myself, dear friend, but for the sake of my friend M. C. Allen. A deep blush colored Tatiana's cheeks at those words, and Charlie bent, as if to reinforce his friend's words, over the delicate hand to press it a long kiss. Only Andre's displeasure seemed to grow, but no one noticed. Raffles continued, addressing Kermart's chef. The house which you bought with my friend's money becomes mine. You will occupy the uninhabited first floor of the villa with your daughter and your cousin. These ground floor rooms remain at the disposal of my friend and me. Comart's chef seemed to think for a moment, then said in a low voice. I must, of course, accept each of your terms, but shall we continue our business beyond that? No, I forbid you, replied Raffles. But we need money for our sacred cause, complained Comart's chef. I'll provide it for you assured the pretended American. I am running a large business here in France, and the proceeds of my ventures will largely benefit your business. I think this will please you, for then you run no more danger of destroying a human life and poisoning your child's soul. Comart's Jeff looked up with deep gratitude at the man who had appeared to him as a rescuer. Then he seemed to think for a moment. Finally he spoke. Even though circumstances should not compel me to accept your terms, I would do so under all circumstances, for you are magnanimous and noble. I just wanted to make one request to you. Speak, replied Harrison. After some hesitation, Comart's Jeff began again. Let us keep these rooms, for only Tatiana and I live here. Andre's house is in a solitary house in the Rubaion, it is connected to this villa by a secret subterranean passage. That's interesting. Raffles said, I need to know more about that. I have no reason to hide anything from you, said Comart's chef, I beg you to follow me. He opened a door that led from the bedroom to a side room. Raffles entered and was astonished to see a great spacious room, which contained not a single piece of furniture. Only a small lithography press, a melting furnace, a typesetting box and a very primitive, rough wooden shelf on the wall, on which bottles and small boxes were untidily mixed up were in this room, which received its light from a large, now through curtains closed window. In a corner opposite the window was a chimney decorated with rich carvings obliquely. Surprised at the strange furniture this room contained, Raffles paused for a moment on the threshold. Comart's chef did not wait for his questions, but immediately began to explain. Here is my laboratory, I am a chemist by trade and here in this room I am making the bonbons which Tatiana needs to anesthetize our victims. On this small lithograph press we print pamphlets, which from here are smuggled into the Ottoman Empire with great difficulty. And where is the secret passage? The American asked. Here, look. Comart's Jeff had gone to the fireplace, at the push of a spring cleverly concealed in the carving, he pushed the mantelpiece aside like a door. He pointed Raffles to a narrow entrance which had now become visible. Raffles approached. He looked into the dark opening and saw a staircase leading down, but the lower part of which was lost in the darkness. Bring light, he ordered Comart's chef, we will go down. At this moment Andre appeared at the threshold of the door leading to the bedroom. He looked at Raffles, his face twisted with anger, and hissed with difficulty. You shall leave my house alone, the old one. He pointed to Comart's chef, you may let yourself be bluffed, not me. Raffles looked the young man in the eye with imperturbable composure. If words are not enough, 
I have other means for you. Then he turned his back on him in disdain. Behind Andre, Raffles saw Charlie, who had heard the quarrels. Andre, however, seemed to have calmed down and, followed by Charlie, he now entered the room. Comart's Jeff, meanwhile, had lit a lantern that stood on the shelf, and now went down the narrow stairs with the light. The American followed, behind him Andre and finally the pretended Scott M. C. Allen. At Comart's Jeff's request, Charlie closed the mantelpiece, which served as a door, behind them, and by the flickering light of the lantern they descended a steep spiral staircase of about forty steps. The corridor they now reached could have been twelve or fifteen meters lower than the street. The passage itself was so wide that two men could pass each other. Lord Lister realized that he was here in one of the deep shafts which today, like the remains of the ancient catacombs, crisscross subterranean Paris. Moldy skulls and half-digested bones that lay on the bottom proved that Lord Lister's conjecture was correct. Slowly the four men moved forward by the light of the lantern. Suddenly Raffles felt Andre pushing past him. Before he realized what he was up to, Andre had placed himself between him and Comart's chef, and at the same time a blow rang out. The young man had thrown the lantern to the ground, the light went out, and an impenetrable darkness surrounded them all. Instantly Raffles understood the seriousness of the moment. He wanted to quickly pull out his revolver and electric flashlight, but already he felt himself grabbed by two arms and flung to the ground. A strong hand clasped his neck, and in a threatening voice it sounded in his ears. Villain, make light or I'll strangle you. Raffles recognized Charlie Brand's voice, who believed he had Andre. He wanted to warn Charlie, but he tried in vain to speak a word, his neck was clamped as if in a screw. But there a faint ray of light penetrated the darkness, and Tatiana approached the group with great speed. She held a lantern in her left hand, which gave off a brilliant light. At the same moment Andre crept over to Charlie, who was bent over Lord Lister. He held a gleaming dagger in his raised hand. A hoarse laugh came from the lips of the villain, and before Charlie could look up, the dagger had penetrated his side. With a cry Charlie started to rise, but fell unconscious on Raffles, who now rose from the ground with all his strength. Lord Lister surveyed the situation with a single glance, and immediately understood what had happened here. Knocked down by a blow, the old man lay on the floor beside the lantern. Charlie had sunk close to Raffles, and Andre stood dead white against the wall, clutching the bloodied weapon. With a curse the villain now wanted to throw himself at Tatiana, but Raffles was ahead of him. Holding the pistol in his right hand, he called out to the young man. Back or I'll shoot. Andre wanted to rush on his new foe, but as he turned, his foot slipped, he fell, and his own killer weapon plunged into his heart. A stream of blood appeared, a brief agony ensued, and Andre was a corpse. Only now did Tatiana see that McAllen was wounded. With a cry of terror she pulled her clothes from the wound, then used her handkerchief to staunch the blood. Raffles, seeing that Comart's Jeff awoke from his unconsciousness, pushed aside the trembling Tatiana. Leave it, dear, I will carry our friend back to the villa. I hope his wound is harmless, help your father, who needs your support. He then picked up Charlie and carried him back to the stairs. Leaning on his daughter's arm, the old Comart's Jeff followed. With difficulty they climbed the stairs, and as the old man sank exhausted into a chair, Raffles, with Tatiana's help, laid the wounded friend on the young girl's bed. A cursory examination had convinced him that the wound was indeed innocent. Above all, a strong bandage had to prevent further blood loss. With moist eyes Tatiana's father listened to Raffles' account of what had happened in the subterranean passage. When the old man had regained his composure, Raffles bade him make the journey once more to the house at the other end of the corridor. He dared confidently entrust his friend to the care of the young girl, and without delay the two men set out again. The hallway was the same size everywhere. Finally, after the pair had covered a two-mile road, the grey guide suddenly stopped. Raffles saw by the light of the land and the worn steps of a stone staircase, which was not so high as those leading to the villa. The six narrow steps led to a door, which had been cut almost invisibly into the wall, and which was now opened by Comart's chef. The bright daylight shone in both men's faces. Raffles pocketed his electric lantern and followed Comart's chef into a small room whose chimney, like in the villa of the Avenue du Bois de Boulogne, covered the entrance to the catacombs. It appeared to be a sleeping chamber, 
for in one of the corners was a bed. The narrow, old-fashioned windows looked out onto a garden. Thick curtains, which hung to the floor, prevent one from looking inside. Raffles stepped to one of the windows and opened the curtain. He saw that the room was on the ground floor, and on the other side of the garden he noticed a one-story house, the front of which probably faced the street. The room he was in belonged to a separate garden house. Komart's chef told him that his suspicions were correct. The garden house, which consisted of only two rooms opening onto a small porch, belonged to the house in the Rubaion, inhabited entirely by its owner, an old bachelor Menuizia. This Monsieur Menuizia was the subject of conversations of all chatty women from turns that was the name of the part of the town in which this house was situated. His stinginess was proverbial, and all sorts of conjectures were made about the origin of his immeasurable wealth. Doubtful ventures and usury seemed to be the chief sources of his capital. He had long ceased to practice his usury and lived quietly, but his insatiable stinginess prevented him from enjoying his treasures. He lived with his old housekeeper, who was said to have been his former lover, and was glad that he had found a well-paying tenant for his garden house, of whose subterranean exit he had no idea. Raffles had listened with great interest to Comart's Jeff's stories. This Monsieur Menuizier seemed to interest him greatly, and the plan immediately occurred to him to make this former usurer the next of his victims. Without letting Comart's Jeff notice this, he began the retreat with this. First Charlie had to get back on his feet and Andre's body had to be removed. The latter could most easily be done by digging a grave for him in the bottom of the subterranean passage. Raffles had to undertake this unpleasant work alone, for Charlie lay helpless on the sickbed and Comart's Jeff's support could not be counted on in this work. When evening came the great unknown began his work. Equipped with a pickaxe and spade, he went down to the spot where the battle had taken place. Andre's corpse lay in a pool of blood, into which the water drops softly and hauntingly fell from the damp roof of the corridor. Without needing his pickaxe, within fifteen minutes he had dug a three-foot hole in the loamy ground. He put the body in it. Then he threw the wet, sticky bits of earth back into the opening, and after another quarter of an hour had elapsed, all traces of the bloody battle had disappeared. Wearily Raffles leaned against the wall. The unusual work in a stooped position had tired him far more than he had imagined. But he had neither time nor desire to rest for long. He laid his tools on the ground, took up his lantern, and continued down the hall, for he wished to subject the wondrous garden house to his inquiring glances once more. Soon he had reached the end of the corridor where the garden house lay. Carefully he put out the light of the lantern and opened the mysterious door. The dim light that penetrated through the window sufficed for him. He looked around the room with an expression of satisfaction. The result of this nocturnal investigation seemed to satisfy his desires, the plan that had occurred to him took on more solid forms. Carefully he disappeared again behind the chimney and closed the door on the outside. He rekindled the light in the lantern, and while his active brain was busy working out his new plans, Raffles made his way back to the villa in the Avenue du Bois de Boulogne. Chapter 5 Tatiana The Room which had hitherto served as Tatiana's sleeping quarters, had undergone a great transformation. McCallan had now taken up residence here to recover from his wound, which fortunately turned out to be harmless. The dagger had penetrated his flesh without striking any private parts, but Charlie had suffered much loss of blood. When Raffles had returned from the catacombs, he had found everything in readiness to nurse the patient. Tatiana had arranged everything in her own room with the help of the housekeeper. The bed on which she herself had recently awakened from her sedation had been replaced by a divan. On this she carried the wounded man with all her strength, and when Raffles returned with Comart's Jeff he found the girl hunched over his friend in terror, who, wrapped in blankets and flattened on soft pillows, was still unconscious. The calm American soon succeeded in reassuring himself and the others. First, with the aid of mild stimulants, which he found in Comart's Jeff's laboratory. He regained consciousness, even if only temporarily. He then examined the wound, whereupon he placed a carefully applied bandage, and now decided not to fetch a doctor, lest he run the risk of betraying their common secret. Thus McCallan had to recover without medical assistance. Charlie had returned to his state of unconsciousness, which lasted for a few days and then gave way to a sense of blankness, so that he recognized nothing around him. 
He saw nothing of the mysterious work Raffles was doing, any more than the sacrificial care of the fair-haired young girl, who did not leave his bed day and night. He did not notice how an expression of joy spread over her sweet countenance when, in his fits of fever, the name Tatiana was heard from his pale lips. These were moments of supreme happiness for Tatiana Komartschev. She understood then that the young man did not hate or despise her, that he had forgiven her, and she redoubled her care for the sick person. The relationship between Raffles and her had also become more friendly. The queer American spent hours in the room with the secret exit, and Tatiana was so absorbed in her care for the patient that she paid no attention to the sounds which repeatedly came to her from that room. One day when Charlie was suddenly more restless than usual, the frightened girl knocked on the door of the room where the American was. Within. It sounded, and she quickly opened the door. For a moment she stood in astonishment, for so much had changed in the room that she noticed. First of all, she saw that the lithography press and the shelf with her father's chemicals were gone but her thoughts were too occupied with the patient for her to think about it for more than a moment. She informed the American of McAllen's plight and Raffles hastened to his friend's couch. He soon became convinced that a heavy dream was making the poor boy restless, and he spoke jestingly to Tatiana that the patient was dreaming of his nurse. A deep blush covered the girl's face, and without any intention, only to divert the conversation, she inquired why the changes had been made in the adjoining room. Raffles suddenly became serious. My child, he said, don't ask everything. It is often dangerous to know. With a friendly smile he stroked her cheek and then returned to his room. Tatiana, too, returned to her bedside position. The patient seemed to have calmed down. Tatiana sat in the armchair next to the divan on which McAllen lay. Her blonde head sank back, weary from the long watch, and sleep closed her eyes. There was a deep calm in the room, the regular tick of the pendulum seemed to make the silence more complete. Raffles, who had briefly appeared on the doorstep, had picked up hat and cane, and had gone out. Patient and nurse were asleep. The patient's head shifted restlessly on his pillow, and at last Charlie's eyes opened. He looked around the room in amazement. He had to think for a long time before he could remember what had happened. Again he lived through what had happened in the catacombs and once again he felt the murderous steel penetrating his side. After that his memory failed him, he did not know what had happened to him afterwards. Suddenly his eyes fell upon the slumbering girl who was resting in a chair beside the divan. A ray of joy brightened his face. She who had assisted him in his dreams like a savior, she was therefore really near him. How long he had lain here he did not know, but she had watched over him, persistently and faithfully, until sleep overtook her. A feeling of deep gratitude overcame him and he looked at the slumbering girl with emotion. But what was that? Tatiana did not sleep peacefully. She dreamed and two big tears rolled down her cheeks. The recovering man could no longer contain his pity. In a low voice he cried. Tatiana. The girl opened her eyes. She awoke as if from a frightened dream, and her shy gaze fell upon Charlie, who was half erect. For God's sake, what are you doing, you must not move yet. Tatiana had jumped up in terror and softly forced the patient to lie down again. Smiling, Charlie obeyed but he held her hand in his as he spoke reassuringly. I feel completely healthy. My wound is certainly already healed, but you are sad, you have wept in your sleep. With a melancholy tone in her voice, Tatiana replied. In my dream I have lived through the terrible events of my childhood. My family's misfortune brought out my tears. If you knew all my sorrows, you would despise me no more. I despise you. Charlie straightened up again. I adore you, Tatiana. I am grateful for the chance that brought me near you, I thank Andre for the wound he inflicted on me, for you have healed me. Tatiana, how could I despise you, I who love you? The girl withdrew her hand from his and stood up. No, don't go any further. I cannot answer you until you know my story. You must know what led my poor father and me to choose the profession by which you came to know me and of which you and your friend were almost the victims. If you love me, you will first know that I also deserve your respect. With glowing cheeks and shining eyes she faced the astonished McAllen. But Tatiana, stay calm, he said in a concerned tone. I am calm, she replied with a smile. Will you listen to me? And when he nodded in the affirmative, Tatiana Komartschev began her story. Chapter 6 
The history of Count Komart's chef. Our family, that is to say my father's, is of Russian descent, and Komart's chef counts already existed under the reign of Ivan the Terrible. They were wealthy sheep breeders in the plains of Ukraine. Under Tsar Alexander I, my great-grandfather had to flee for political reasons. He was old and widowed and only one son lived with him on his property. They left their home at night. They took whatever money they had with them, and after a long wandering they settled in Turkish territory, in present-day Bulgaria, where they were safe from Russian law. In the province of East Romelia, near the small town of Atos, a few miles from the Black Sea, the two refugees settled in one of the valleys of the Balkan Mountains. For a few thousand rubles they got land from the Passover, who as governor administered the district. This governor, Elamea Pasca was his name, was a benevolent, righteous man, who rejoiced that the will and work ethic of my great-grandfather and his son urged the population, which was partly Ottoman Mohammedans, partly Bulgarian Christians, to abandon their habitual indifference and unemployment. Elamea Pasca was pleased with the good example set by the Komarts chefs who had given up their title of count, for his district became a model of prosperity for the whole Ottoman Empire. No other governor of the vast empire of the Sultan sent so regularly the revenues of his taxes to Constantinople. My great-grandfather died, and his son, who was married to the daughter of a Bulgarian Wojwode, whose property adjoined ours, took over the management of the property. My father was born a year after the death of my great-grandfather. At that time, popular development in the Balkan states was already improving and my father was sent to Vienna as a boy for his studies. He returned grown up to bury his parents, who one night were both murdered by a band of robbers who had plundered the property. The Passover, who resided in Atos, Elamea Pasca was long dead and none of his successors had inherited his popularity, shrugged his shoulders when my father told him what had happened. The people muttered that he was making common cause with the brigands and that in Stamboul the Sultan's favorites, who knew nothing of these things themselves, formed bands to plunder in the provinces. In impotent rage my father had to submit to his fate. He took the estate under his management and continued the business. Then he chose a new representative, an Armenian, and returned to Vienna. He lived his beloved, the only daughter of a not very wealthy Austrian superior. In Vienna, at the house of the bride's parents, the marriage was concluded, and my father took his young wife to the Black Sea coast. He intended to settle with her on his newly flourishing property there but he was deeply disappointed. When they reached their properties, they found only smoking ruins. The villainous administrator himself have called for the bands of robbers, who had destroyed everything and taken the traitor on their flight. Andre, the two-year-old son of the criminal Armenian, had been left unkempt in the estate. My parents took care of the child and when I was born a year later we were raised together and Andre was generally called my cousin. It was a sad life my parents led. My father armed his workers and formed of them a well-trained, combative troop, and the presence of this small but well-armed brigade gave us some security. It is true that theft was still frequent and even a shepherd was murdered, but the real estate, which contained all of my father's possessions, was spared. The more the mobs kept in the other parts of the empire. In Western Europe, these massacres were believed to have been the result of minor religious disputes. But this view was wrong. Christians and Mohammedans everywhere lived peacefully and contentedly side by side, and both suffered equally from the plundering of the Turkish troops. I was twelve years old, and Andre had just become a lieutenant in my father's brigade, when one day, we were having dinner, the Passover's son from Matos entered our yard with twenty soldiers. My father, suspecting a calamity, wanted to rush out, but already young Ahmed, that was the name of the Passover's son, came in. Ahmed was known as a criminal savage. With brutal courtesy he greeted my mother, whose beauty surprised him. But my father, enraged by the young man's attitude, asked him curtly what he wanted. With kindness well played, Ahmed spoke. Come arts chef Effendi, I come with an unpleasant message, but I think we will come to an agreement. It has been heard in Stamboul that you give your subordinates a military education and provide them with weapons. That is not allowed and the Sultan has sent my father the order to requisition the weapons from you. I have come to beg you to hand over the ammunition and rifles to me. Twenty men of the garrison were given to me in Atos, although I claimed that this was not necessary. I thought you would obey the order of the Sultan. My father had turned pale. But there was no thought of resistance. 
He handed over the weapons the soldiers, except for a few pistols, which he hid, and everything was loaded onto a wagon and taken to Athos. Ahmed took leave, father gave him no opportunity to further trouble my mother with his cowardly flattery. We were alone. But the day would have a terrible end. Night came and we had gone to rest. Suddenly gunshots rang out across the yard, and a bright light shone through the windows of my parents' bedroom. My father rushed to the door, a revolver in his right hand. A single look outside explained everything to him. The barns and stables were ablaze, the robbers drove the flocks away, and outside lay the corpses of the servants murdered in their sleep. There was a cry of horror in my father's ears. He had jumped back into the sleeping chamber in which my mother was. There was a terrible spectacle in his eyes. Ahmed, the son of the Passover, had climbed in through the window with two of the robbers, and now the villain was carrying away the desperate woman, who was defending herself with superhuman strength. A shot from my father's revolver knocked him down, a second killed one of the helpers. The other fled onto the windowsill, but before leaping out he fired his rifle at my mother, who, in the arms of her grief-stricken husband, breathed her last. Flee, flee with Tatiana, were her last words. My father had no other choice, for the murder of Ahmed meant certain death for him. My father took me out of my bedroom, where I, trembling, without knowing what was happening, had heard the terrible. We found Andre hidden in a cupboard, who had fled there. We left that same night. By morning we reached Misavria on foot, the nearby small port on the Black Sea. A compassionate skipper took us to Constanta in Romanian territory, whence we proceeded to Vienna. I was taken to Geneva to a boarding school. What my father did was a mystery to me for a long time. But on my eighteenth birthday he appeared at my boarding house to take me to Paris. He told me everything. I learned that a liberation committee had been formed, whose headquarters was Salonica, but this committee needed money to accomplish its purpose. And so I put myself in the service of a movement which I expected would avenge my mother's death. Tatiana was silent for a moment, then continued, glancing at Charlie. You know what I did and why I did it. Can you still love me? Charlie had settled herself completely into the cushions. Clear tears glittered in his eyes. He drew the young girl to him and spoke in a determined tone. I love you, my child, and your revenge will be mine. Passionately he pressed his lips to Tatiana's mouth, and full of blissful emotion she returned the kiss, which sealed their engagement. Chapter 7 False Coin Mr. Emil Menuizier was more or less nervous. The tenant of his garden house, who should have come to him the day before yesterday to pay the rent due, seemed to have disappeared. He had not seen him for a fortnight. There was no excuse in the eyes of the generous Mr. Menuizier for those who did not pay their rents promptly, and so he spoke of it with deep contempt to his housekeeper, old Coralie. But he found little consolation in the toothless old lady for the loss of money he suffered from the disappearance of his tenant, and so on the third of the new month Mr. Menuizier decided to put a sign on his front door in the Rubaion, stating it read that he was offering his garden house for rent. Mr. Menuizier did not have to wait long. Barely half an hour after the sign hung outside, the first enthusiast arrived. But the old loan shark looked at this home seeker with suspicion. He was a tall man with blonde, rather poorly groomed pointed beard and rich hair. The wide trousers, the black silk bow and the velvet beret, which he wore at an angle on his head, characterized him as an artist and as a painter. M. Menuizier had little sympathy for such people, and the casual appearance of the person entering suggested to the rich man that this young man would also display the same indifference when it came to money matters. What do you wish? So he started the conversation. I would like to see the garden house which you are offering for rent, replied the other, very modestly. I only rent to solid persons, growled Mr. Menuizier in an uncivilized tone, and already he was about to turn his back on the visitor. But the artist didn't seem to give up yet. Full of respect for the wealthy homeowner, he declared. I have money and if I rent your garden house, I will pay you a year in advance. Menuizier turned. That seemed to be a white raven. But, one had to be careful. You must pay me the rent in advance and before you move into the house, said the owner to the visitor. Before I move into the house, repeated it with undiminished modesty. Reassured, Menuizier put on his skullcap, took a bunch of keys, and led the visitor to show him the garden house. The modesty of this tenant was really exemplary, he liked everything, 
he didn't venture a single comment, and when Menuzia had told him the rent, the stranger, who now introduced himself as the portrait painter upon, presented nothing but his wallet. To make it to the day and to pay the owed six months in advance. When do you plan to move in? asked the astonished Menuzia, much friendlier now. Tonight, replied Rapon, and as they passed through the garden again, the house owner called out to the slowly shuffling housekeeper. Take the sign, Coralie, this gentleman, the painter Rapon, still occupies the garden house today. Mumbling a few unintelligible words, the matron disappeared into the house. Menuzia led M. Rapon out into the street, and when he had politely bid him farewell, he returned to the house most satisfied. Rapon had taken up residence in the garden house, but, to Menuizia's great surprise, his baggage was in direct contradiction to the manner in which he had paid his rent. Eight days had passed since the painter had moved into his new home, and Menuizia had not seen him again. The young man had never left the garden house, and his personality seemed more and more incomprehensible to the landlord. For if M. Menuizia did not see his tenant, he heard him all the more, and what he heard made everything more mysterious. At night, and often during the day, and just then when Menuizia was walking in his garden, there came from the garden house, the curtains of which were never drawn, a suspicious sound, the rhythmic regularity of which was reminiscent of a machine. Mr. Menuizia didn't understand. What was the mysterious Rapon up to? How could he own a machine? because it couldn't possibly have been hidden in the meager baggage he had brought with him. And how was it possible that the new inhabitant provided himself with provisions, since he never went out to buy? The most terrifying ideas of the enigmatic behavior of his tenant began to deprive M. Menuizia of his night's rest. The situation became untenable. The rich miser had just risen from the table. Because of the bad night's sleep he did not like the food, and, disgruntled, lighting a pipe, he prepared to take his usual afternoon walk in the garden. The windows of the garden house were still closed, and nothing here betrayed the presence of a human being. But no sooner had he gone a few steps than that same stamping which he believed to be the sound of a machine pressed into his ear again. Who could have known for what criminal purpose was being worked here? The good soul of M. Menuizia rebelled, and this feeling, added to the memory of M. Rapon's modest, almost submissive conduct gave him a sudden courage. He had to be sure about the doings of his tenant and he knocked determinedly at the door of the garden house. In the same instant the sound was silenced. Mr. Menuizia waited. He listened in breathless suspense, but no one seemed to let him in. He knocked again, louder and bolder this time. After a short pause, slow steps approached, the bolt was retracted, and the door opened a crack, exposing the startled countenance of Mr. Rapon. What do you wish, Monsieur Menuizia? asked the tenant, apparently unable to suppress his fear and surprise. What is that noise you are making? asked the landlord in a stern tone. What are you doing in my house? But I do no harm, I work, it returned trembling. Menuizia grew more and more courageous. He pushed the door all the way open with his foot and, taking his pipe out of his mouth, entered. The door leading from the vestibule to one of the chambers was open, and without being deterred by Rapon's terrified exclamation, But Monsieur Menuizia, what are you doing? The brave man went into the room. Rapon had followed him, and with eyes and mouth wide open in terror, he leaned against the door as if crushed, staring in dismay at the intruder who had discovered his secret. Menuizia immediately surveyed the situation. A printing press stood in the center of the room, and it was obvious for what purpose it was being used. A heap of brand new 500 franc notes lying on a small table beside the machine clearly explained the purpose of this mysterious work. He looked back in fear, but this man, who stood trembling and trembling at the door, looking at him helplessly and in alarm, had no fear of violence. Mr. Menuizia's great right hand picked up the packet of banknotes, and in a voice that expressed the great strength of a law abiding, Honest citizen, he bellowed at the criminal. So, you counterfeit banknotes, I will hand you over to the courts. Rapon fell to his knees. Mr. Menuizia, spare me, I pray you, have pity on me, I will be grateful to you for life. Mr. Menuizia was sufficiently resistant to such requests. His long career as a loan shark had encased his heart, and so he had no difficulty in playing offended honesty to the heartfelt pleas of the hapless man. I do not spare a criminal. It sounded full of dignity from his lips. 
If you leave this room to hand me over to the police, I will take my life. Rapon exclaimed desperately. This threat, too, seemed to make no impression on the homeowner. He had gone to the window to take a close look at one of the counterfeit notes against the light. Damn, the imitation was very successful, and Monsieur Manuizier's admiration was so obvious that Rapon even dared to approach. Manuizier investigated further. He examined the bill from all sides, squeezed it together, then smoothed it again to hold it up to the light again. No doubt about it, the work was so perfect that even on close examination the forgery was not noticeable. How many of those notes have you already spent? He asked in a stern tone to Rapon, who stood trembling behind him. None yet, wailed the other, this is my first attempt, and I lack the necessary capital to continue working. You could have done a lot of harm, said Menuizia in a softer tone, no one would discover the forgery. I know, replied Rapon softly, and I will exchange these notes in your presence at the Crédit Lyonnais or any other office without difficulty. So do you think so? Menuizier asked, and his sternness and indignation were no longer apparent. Rapon's gaze remained fixed in anticipation on the features of his landlord, and he clearly noticed how the expression of the hypocritical wrath of the old usurer's face was fading, giving way more and more to undisguised greed. Rapon seemed to be a man of man, for otherwise he would not have dared to suggest, even if in a mysterious, whispering tone. Mr. Menuizier, if you have pity on me, and if you are sensible, we can both make millions by means of my art, without running any risk. The valiant householder now fell completely out of his role. Without making the slightest effort to hide his greed, he asked, hoarse with emotion. How then, what should I do? Rapon seemed to have lost all fear, and he spoke now in a cool business tone. Mr. Manuizier, the matter is very simple. The device, which I have put together with great difficulty, cannot be trusted. I'm missing the money first of all, to make the paper I need for the production of the banknotes myself. My plan is to make about 300 pieces of these 500 franc notes every week for a year. But I need equipment and chemicals and lack the necessary capital. How much should you have? The landlord asked. I'll tell you later, replied Rapon. First you must convince yourself of the soundness of my work. Keep three of the banknotes that are here, Monsieur Menu is here and take them in town to a branch of the Credit Lyonnais, then to the French bank, and then to some bureau de change, to buy one of the notes for gold at each of these offices. To exchange, each of the officers will examine the note more or less closely. However long this investigation takes and how carefully it is carried out, no one will discover the forgery and they will pay you the amount in gold. Menuizier trembled with emotion. If all this were really true, the treasures he could thus acquire were immeasurable. The greed in him grew so great that he no longer thought of keeping an appearance as if he were a good and honorable man. He took three bills put them in his hand, and as he handed the rest back to Rapon, she spoke nervously. I'll be back in an hour, wait for me. I'll wait, replied Rapon. No sooner had the door of the garden house closed behind the owner than Rapon drew back the curtains a little and looked after Mr. Menuizier with a smile. When he could no longer see the old gentleman, he withdrew from the window. He had returned to normal, all fear had left him, and an expression of great satisfaction was written on his face. At his leisure he lit a cigarette, after which he lay down on the bed, which stood in a corner of the room. Menuizier had folded the three bills and put them in his waistcoat pocket. He locked himself in his bedroom, where the safe was located, and with trembling fingers he took a five hundred franc note from a wallet. He put the three bills his tenant had given him on the table next to his own bill and closed the curtains on the windows. Then he lit a light, and under the yellow glow of the kerosene lamp began to examine again. He examined the drawing with painful precision. He looked at the watermarks and saw that there was not the slightest deviation. There was not the slightest trace of forgery, and tired from the long examination the old man stared into the bad light of the lamp that shone on his greedy countenance. His eyes fell on the bills. A great fortune he could acquire without any difficulty or danger, and he still lingered. Why? Would luck ever smile on him like that again? He got up and got ready to go out. He put the counterfeit notes individually in the different pockets of his waistcoat, then he blew out the lamp and left. With staggering steps he went up the street to Avenue Neal, where there was a branch of the Crédit Lyonnais, the principal French banker's office. But when he stood at the door of the exchange office, a terrible terror overcame him. 
If the clerk at the counter, who must have had an extraordinarily keen eye, discovered the forgery, what then? The old loan shark hesitated. But he was an old acquaintance in this office. If the forgery was discovered, at most one would confiscate the bill presented without suspecting him of the counterfeit. He would then be regarded as a victim of some counterfeit coiner. Resolutely, he finally entered. There was no audience and Menuizia went to the counter, where behind the official was writing at a desk. With a slightly trembling hand the old gentleman laid down one of the bills before the officer, saying, Will you change me five hundred francs, please? This, an elderly man, took the note, rubbed it between his fingers, held it up to the light, and then placed it on a bundle of other notes in an iron box. Do you want gold or small paper? Gold, said Menuizia, keeping his eyes fixed on the official, and following his every move attentively. The cashier deposited the amount of gold before Monsieur Menuizia. He waited for the old gentleman to put the money in his hand, after which he returned to his desk, not caring any more about the customer. Menuizia went out. Damn, that would have been easy. No doubt about it, the forgery was undetectable, for this cashier had not noticed anything despite the investigation. The usurer now went to a branch of the French bank, the official state bank of the Republic. Here without hesitation he crossed the threshold of the cashier, where he deposited the second copy of Rapon's notes at the counter. Again the usual inquiry followed, and again the usurer received the amount of gold pieces paid. Suddenly he got more courage. Taking out the third bill, he said to the officer. Will you give me another five hundred francs in gold? Silently he accepted the bill presented to him, examined it too, and paid the old gentleman what he had asked for. Menuizia went out. There was no longer any doubt, the forgery was undetectable, and all fear and anxiety were gone. An hour had passed and Rapon was still stretched out on his bed, smoking cigarettes happily until a modest knock on the door made him jump. A moment later Menuizia stood before him, his face dark red. Furious joy brightened his little grey rogue eyes, and a few flakes of grey hair clung to the sweat-covered forehead. Scarcely had he closed the door behind him when he exclaimed. Mr. Rapon, it's colossal, the officials exchanged the notes without a word of protest. Rapon did not share his landlord's excitement, he seemed to have expected this result. He sat calmly on the edge of his bed and asked Menuizia, who was counting out 1,500 francs in gold money on a table beside the bed. Well, my dear, do you want to have further to do with it? But I must first draw your attention to the following, the capital I need is very great. Since I have nothing, you must furnish the money, for which you will receive half of the total proceeds. I undertake to send you at least 150 notes of 500 francs each week from the tenth day after you have paid up the capital. These banknotes will always have different control numbers, so that no objections will be made when changing. The business will be continued for 52 weeks, not a day longer, because we have to take into account that after about one year the forgery will come to light. When the manufacture has ceased for so long, discovery is no longer to be feared, and our harvest will be sufficient. What this tenant told sounded so seductive, and the experiment of the moment had been so brilliantly successful that Menuizia asked in a hoarse voice. How much money do you need, Mr. Rapon? The painter looked at Menuizia long and hard. Then, pronouncing each syllable with emphasis, he named the sum. Six times a hundred thousand francs. Isn't that a bit much? The other asked hesitantly. It is a trifle compared to what you will receive in return replied Rapon calmly. What do you need so much for? asked Menuizia. I'm not telling you, that's my secret, came the mouth of the painter. After a short pause, Menuizia spoke. I'll bring you the money this evening. Rapon stood up. All right, he said, I expect you, today is the twelfth. On the twenty-second I will be ready with all the preparations, and on the twenty-ninth you will receive the first delivery of at least one hundred and fifty copies. Menuizia left, and when he returned at seven o'clock in the evening he handed his tenant the money in six packets, each containing a hundred banknotes of one thousand francs. Rapon counted it and quietly put the money in his pocket. Shall we make a written agreement? asked Menuizia in a modest tone. With pleasure, declared his tenant indifferently, and at once he wrote a contract, which both signed. On the evening of that same day, the wealthy American Harrison called for Mr. Komart's chef and his daughter, 
and handed them a sum of four times a hundred thousand francs on behalf of their charitable efforts. Speechless with astonishment, the old Comart's chef was barely able to express his thanks. Tatiana bent to kiss the benefactor's hand. Harrison, however, straightened the young girl up again. You need not thank me, I have been happy in my speculations, that is all. And, stroking Tatiana's blonde locks, he continued in a soft tone. And you, my dear, save your kisses for someone else. A blush painted the pretty girl's cheeks. She had seen Harrison at these words go to MC. Alan had watched, who witnessed the conversation. With a kind smile Harrison spoke. Yes, children, you need not hide it from me, I have already understood it. Thereupon he went off with Komart's chef, leaving the two young men alone with their luck. It wasn't until after midnight that Donald Harrison returned home. He immediately proceeded to the room which communicated with the subterranean passage. He turned on the electric light and looked around the room, which looked even more bare now than when Komart's chef had had his laboratory here. Now I will bring everything back here again, it sounded from his lips. He took from a wardrobe in a corner of the room a not new suit and a long-haired wig. Now the metamorphosis began, and after a few minutes the carefully dressed Donald Harrison had turned into the slovenly painter Rapon, the same Rapon who had received 600,000 francs from Monsieur Manuizia. He took a seat at a table that served as his writing desk and began a letter. When he had finished this, he closed it in a place setting and wrote the address on it in large, clear letters. He put the letter in a side pocket of his coat and opened the mantelpiece. By the light of his flashlight he disappeared down the stone stairway into the subterranean passage. After a few minutes he had reached the other exit at the building in Rubayan. Here too he opened the secret door, at the same time he put his lantern in his pocket and entered the room. Mr. Rapon, Mr. Emile Manuizia's tenant, was again in the room in which the counterfeit notes were made, and with a triumphant smile he looked about him at the many objects which had rendered him such excellent service here. Raffles laughed again at the thought of the little effort he had had in flying the old loan shark. But he had no time now to indulge in such musings for long. He checked again whether the curtains were properly closed, then he switched on the light. The house and garden lay in deep tranquility and no one heard him. Raffles took out a small screwdriver and began to work as quietly as possible. Carefully he unscrewed the screws holding the parts of the lithograph press. He took everything apart and set the various pieces on the floor by the chimney. He had been doing this for about an hour and now looked around the room, which was bare and empty. Of all the furniture, only the bed and the small table on which the lamp stood had remained intact. The other objects lay, broken into pieces, on the floor by the mantelpiece. The night worker now opened the secret door again and carried all the pieces down into the subterranean passage. Then he returned to the room for the last time. From his pocket he took the letter and placed it in the center of the small table, after which he picked up the lamp and disappeared quietly behind the chimney, which he carefully closed again. As he set the lamp on the stone steps, he looked for a few moments at the damp floor of the corridor, the parts of the strange furniture which he, as Rapon, had brought into this house. Transferring all this back to Comart's chef's former office could wait until the next day. Now he needed rest, which he deserved. And swiftly Raffles walked back down the subterranean passage, smiling at the thought of the face Menuizia would make when he read the letter left for him. The night following the conclusion of the contract with his tenant, Mr. Menuizia did not sleep either. But now it was not the anxiety about an unsolved secret that robbed him of sleep. Now it was his great greed, which was soon to be satisfied in the most brilliant way. Already at five o'clock he arose to go into the garden, but no sound came from the garden house, and he did not have the courage to knock at the door. Perhaps Mr. Upon was asleep and would resent such a disturbance. Restlessly he walked through his house and every half hour he was again at the door of Rapon's house listening. But all remained silent and Menuizia grew more and more restless. He did not touch any food, and when it was two o'clock in the afternoon he could stand it no longer. He knocked softly on the garden shed door. No one answered. Menuizia knocked harder, but again to no avail. He was banging on the door with both fists now, but nothing moved inside. Frightened by this deathly silence, the old miser stood distraught, waiting. It suddenly occurred to him that the spare keys to the garden house were in his possession. 
As quickly as he could he hurried home, and a few minutes later he was again at his tenant's door with a large bunch of keys in his hand. Again he knocked as hard as he could, and when again no one opened, he unlocked the door. He entered cautiously. As he stood on the threshold of the room where the agreement had been made the previous day, he paled with terror. The room was empty, only the bed and a small table stood in one corner. The printing machine and all the other objects that had surprised him so much the day before were gone, and no trace of Rapon, the tenant, was to be found. The old man's knees trembled as he entered the room. He opened the curtains and now he saw a letter on the table. The letter was addressed. To Mr. Menuizia. Usurer and miserable. He opened the cover with trembling hands. He read. I am vain enough to assume that my name is known to you too. I, who rented your garden house under the disguise of a poor painter, I am Raffles, whom the police of all countries are looking for. And after I have told you with whom you are dealing, it will not surprise you that I felt called to do justice against you also, by taking from you a portion of your money, in which the blood and the tears of countless unfortunates cling. In doing so you lent me, as stupidly as possible, a helping hand, for the bills which I gave you to exchange were genuine, and by having made yourself in writing, I have the proof. An accomplice of an intended crime, which is the forgery of banknotes, you have cut yourself off to call for the help of the police. You see, then, that you have fallen into a trap on every side. I know that I have taken only a part of your wealth from you, that which you have left is sufficient to meet your needs. Live well and think again of your companion. John C. Raffles. It dawned on the old miser's eyes, a cry of impotent rage came from his lips, and he collapsed unconscious. Thus old Coralie found him, and dragged him to his room, where Menuizier awoke from his impotence. Since that day the garden house in the Rue Bayonne has remained uninhabited, Monsieur Menuizier shivered at the thought of once again taking a stranger into his house. The great unknown, however, continued on his own way. What he did and experienced some time later in London, the readers will hear in the next issue. The End Thank you for listening to today's episode I really hoped you enjoyed it. There will be more to come, please subscribe not to miss out on what is next. I will be looking forward to your return. The music is by Madfan from Pixabay. To support this and other artists go to pixabay.com. Sheila